I remember this day I was in my therapist's office and I was saying like, I'm just so sick of being like a weak person. And of course she, she didn't say, see it that way. She helped me to reframe, but I'm like, you know, everything's going so well and it looks like my life is fine, but like one thing could happen. I could get one phone call or one fight with a friend and I would just unravel, but that's not strong. And like, how can I, I I think I was in conflict. Like, how can I work with these little girls and, you know, girl power, be confident, love yourself. But I wasn't like, I was trying to live it, but I didn't really feel it. And she's kind of a funny therapist, such a straight shooter. But she said to me, you know, you run, right? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, how did you get good at running? I don't know. I do it every day. Like I practiced. And she's like, it's the same thing with being strong. Like you have to like actually be intentional about practicing being strong every single day. What does it take to put your life's work out there in a really big way? How much can I do with this one precious life? Welcome to The Selfish Gift. If you have a growing girl or a young woman in your life, you know the intense pressure she faces to be pretty, to be popular, to be perfect. And sometimes it may seem to her like her contentment is less important than living up to the expectations and images that she sees on social media. My guest today is dedicated to putting the power back in girls' hands and helping girls to develop the skills and confidence that will set them up for a fulfilling life. Lindsay Seely is the CEO and founder of Bold New Girls and Brave New Boys. She's also the author of three books that I had the deep honor and pleasure of being the publisher for, uh, called Growing Strong Girls, Rooted, Resilient, and Ready, and her newest title, Made for More. Lindsay, welcome to The Selfish Gift. I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's nice to see you. So you have called yourself a girl advocate and a girlhood enthusiast, which I just love that description. But what does that mean to you? And what does it look like in your business and career? Well, I think everything I do really has girls at the center. So if I think of, I love the word empowerment and really giving power or giving strength. And so to work with girls, I think um, championing them and, um, and really being their advocate means putting them at the center of my work. It means listening to them and truly hearing them and seeing them and valuing them. And all of this is to then help them see, hear, and value themselves. So it's, it's a beautiful process. I think of, yes, I'm helping them, but that's not, that's just the beginning. I'm helping them help themselves. And that's, you know, that's what we all want is to grow these strong girls. And how does that um, take form? Are you doing that? You're doing that through one-on-one individual coaching and what other kinds of um, uh, services and work do you do? Yeah, so I always have done the one-on-one and that's over the years, it's become more, it's grown a lot to giving workshops for girls and for parents for presenting and and speaking, um, for obviously writing the books and promoting the books. And really at the beginning of Bold New Girls, I remember being very intentional about being really open and flexible to all possibilities. So I said mostly yes, unless I was, you know, physically unable to do something or there was a logistical um, concern, but just yes, yes, yes to however people need me to help them and to show up for these girls and their champions. I'm, I'm a yes. Amen. Well, that is just so in line with what I know about you, Lindsay, you know, having had the pleasure of knowing you and having you in my life for the last I don't know what it's been seven years or more, perhaps, um, mm-hmm. since your first book was published. Um, I see so much boldness in you, you know, in the way that you um, tackle you, this life mission that you have. Can you tell me a little bit about like why it's so important to you? What, why, why do you have this passion and, and have, have you made um, assisting girls in this way your life's work? Well, I think it probably began like with all of us, you know, when we're young, we, we want to be confident and we want to be bold. And I think at first we all are, and we quote unquote, lose it. And we start to, you know, really accommodate, let's say to the demands outside of us. So societal pressures and cultural pressures, for sure, peer pressures. And we sort of lose, I call it the magic. We lose that thing inside of us that really 
um, is free to shine. And I think I, I saw that happening in myself. I was quite an aware kid and, you know, around 10, 11, I started to hold back and become less confident and definitely more shy. And, and just really, I became who I thought people wanted me to be, and that wasn't mm. necessarily my true self. So, you know, you start to realize that about yourself as you grow. And I think I, I did really well at like doing all the things. Like I, mm -hmm. I went to school and I got the job and I had relationships, but I just felt like when I hit probably mid thirties, I was like, it, it's all right. Like on paper, I look like I'm doing good, but why don't I feel good? Like I never really felt secure or strong or like I was actually being my true self. And I remember this day I was in my therapist's office and I was saying like, I'm just so sick of being like a weak person. And of course she, she didn't say, see it that way. She helped me to reframe, but I'm like, you know, everything's going so well and it looks like my life is fine, but like one thing could happen. I could get one phone call or one fight with a friend and I would just unravel, but that's not strong. And like, how can I, I, I think I was in conflict. Like, how can I work with these little girls and, you know, girl power, be confident, love yourself. But I wasn't like, I was trying to live it, but I didn't really feel it. And she's kind of a funny therapist, such a straight shooter. But she said to me, you know, you run, right? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, how did you get good at running? I don't know. I do it every day. Like I practiced and she's like, it's the same thing with being strong. Like you have to like actually be intentional about practicing being strong every single day. And so what does that mean practically? It probably um, meant like using my voice, like speaking up and setting those boundaries and being really clear on what it is that matters most to me and, and being my real self and showing people, you know, the good stuff and the flaws and, and being able to like be a person of integrity. And like, it kind of made me scratch my head. Like that doesn't seem like, it seems so strange, like to practice being strong, but that was really the beginning of like, okay, I'm going to actually work on this strong thing. And I think then just really naturally, it became like, whoa, if I can practice something every day and become stronger and start to feel less wobbly, I called it, or more secure, then that's it. Like that's the, you know, the magic or whatever. And then of course, naturally, I, I want to teach girls this. And they're like, no, wait, like you don't have to like kind of settle for that mm, good enough or I don't feel good, but this is just me. Or I think we say things like, oh, I'm just an anxious person. Well, mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be that way. And mm -hmm. so that's probably my definition of like empowerment, like going through my journey and going, oh, I didn't really feel that great. Well, what is it? How can I feel great? How can I like step into my power and my purpose and, you know, really allow myself to shine and be, and be me? So that's how I got really obsessed with this word strong. <laughs> I love that story, Lindsay. Yeah. So, and, and so to start with, let me just like make sure I've got it straight to start with when you had this kind of like awakening for yourself, you were working with girls, but not in the way that you are now. Right. So back then you were an educator or working in a different way. And this was the catalyst to becoming well, an empowerment coach or how did that, how did that yeah, all come it's, it's together? It's really not linear. It's sort of okay. like this very organic circle. Like I, I started my career teaching and it, I was uh -huh. always teaching boys and girls. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that I outgrew that job and I, I was able to step into that truth of like, Hey, I'm just, I'm not happy here. This is someone else's dream. I mm -hmm. could not see myself doing this for more than a few more years. And so then I created Bold New Girls. And that was like a very big deal, like to let go of like the paycheck, the security, the, you know, working for someone else and which felt like it was, I know that's supposed to be security, but it always felt very insecure. Like I always mm. had this, um, ever, this daily fear of being fired. Like I was interesting. Right, right, very, right. So I thought, you know, the only way through this one, Maggie, is to be my own boss, because then essentially I am the only person who can fire me. And I wasn't oh. planning on doing that. So, <laughs> so then I created Bold New Girls. And so like, I was always teaching with girl, teaching girls, but when I shifted to Bold New Girls, I added in that piece that I think was like, really like my passion, which was empowering them. So talking that to them about their stress and anxiety and body image and perfectionism and basically anything. I'll talk about anything they want to talk about. So then that was the marrying really of like what I was trained in, like I'm an educator and then really the empowerment coach, I guess I could call myself. Um, and then I just, I think I 
was always working on myself. Like I've always been really interested in like, why am I the way I am? <laughs> what, what makes me me? And just a very naturally curious person and just really, I'd say somewhat obsessive with personal growth and development. And, and so it all just kind of happened. Like I, I believe we can be living and, and doing our work and not, you know, necessarily the master of it. Like I feel yeah. like it, it sort of works hand in hand. It's like, every single conversation I have with girls is either like I'm bringing in my experience or that conversation is like really like fueling the fire for me to like be even more motivated to um, really commit to like learning and growing and figuring more stuff out. Like I, I don't think we ever end. I think this is the mm -hmm. journey, but I think they really, you know, I, I want to call it sort of the messy middle. Like it's just, <laughs> it all just happened at once. It wasn't as linear as maybe I, I explained. Like, so yeah, it was all, it's always happening. It's always this twofold, like, as I learn, I teach, I've always sort of had that philosophy and I am never, I will never tell girls I have it all figured out or I'm the master of anything. Like I'm figure, I'm right here in the mess with you guys. Like I'm, I just, you know, maybe I have a little bit more life experience, <laughs> but I think yeah. it's really um, a very organic process. I love that so much. Okay. So yeah, so it really came through, you know, your experience of yourself and like de developing some measure of self mastery and like, oh my goodness, I don't have to live with that kind of debilitating level of uncertainty or insecurity or self criticism. I can find some peace. I can find some strength and some relief from, you know, that, that monkey on my back that's been, you know, sort of like um, tearing me down in private in my, in my own head. And I, I think what I love about what you're saying about um, the personal growth aspect of it, Lindsay. And I completely share this with you. I'm super mm -hmm. like that myself. I'm, you know, you use the word obsessed with personal growth. Me too. Um, I'm always thinking about, you know, how, how can I live more comfortably in this human being that I am? <laughs> and how can I live more effectively in the world around me? Um, and I, what I love about it is this sort of, um, it's this kind of like dual pronged approach when it starts to really feel good. It's like, I accept myself as I am today. That's a big part of finding peace. And I am working on expanding and growing and developing greater capacities. You know, that's exactly it. And the other day I was listening to someone speak. I can't remember if it was a podcast or on a book, but they were explaining that both can be true acceptance and change. And I think for my yeah. whole life, I was all about the change. And at the same time, I was denying or not liking who I was. So that was sort of, I live in extremes, I find. So it's change, yeah. change, change, push, 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 grow, 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 achieve, prove my worth. Like, but the whole time I was really judging myself. I was yeah. quite cruel to myself. It was like never good enough. I struggle with perfectionism. But the flip side of that coin is if we only accept and there's no change or growth, then we're somewhat complacent. Right. And, and I just don't want where to be. We're not evolving, right? Yeah. And, and so, I don't want to yeah. be comfortable because that's also I mean, like, that can be ignorant and that can be, that can lead us to mental health issues. Yeah. Like I feel like sometimes that's the source of depression or, or feeling, you know, lost or purposeless or, you know, stagnant. And so then when that person said that, I was like, of course we can have, I call it the best of both worlds, but I can accept myself. And that's definitely work in progress. You know, it, that's a hard thing to do. And I can really focus on change and growth. And I can do them at the same time. It's not. Yeah. And in fact, I think that we must, you know, and yeah. I think that what we're discussing right here, right now is so much at the heart of the pressure that girls face, which is, um, you know, it, it, it is about, um, putting, um, really high expectations on ourselves or feeling that they've been put on us by society or by individuals in our lives, parents, teachers, peers, whatever. Um, and that feeling of like, there is a perfect version of me and it's my job to be that perfect version. And I'm measuring myself all the time. And, you know, society does teach us to kind of like be ambitious, strive for more, you know, um, lose weight, do this, get strong, you know, all these various different things that we're supposed to be measuring up to. But what is missing is the self-compassion along the way. I actually think it's really, in, it's, 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 it's essential for those things to be happening um, together where we are um, really loving and embracing ourselves in compassion and also then the, the striving for growth, but then the growth the growth impetus in that case comes from just a desire to um, 
be more fully alive and understand ourselves and experience ourselves more richly rather than trying to measure up. Would you say? Oh, so true. I just, I remember about 10 years ago, I had, I was fairly accomplished, right? So I had, you know, checked all the boxes. Like, and I remember sitting there one day thinking like, I didn't really understand this. It was quite confusing. So, okay. I earned the degrees and I had the career and I had, you know, um, written and, and I had, um, I probably had started some of the books. I think and you had some self-published books under your yeah, belt at that point. So yeah. Writing was happening. And mm-hmm. at this point I might've even been, um, already into growing strong girls. So I was like, Oh, I'm becoming an author and I'd ran the marathons and I had the relationship and I was like, why do I feel empty? Like, what is it? Because I did everything that society told me to do. I'm a very good girl, Maggie. Like, I follow the script. I follow the rules. I did, like, yeah, I did yeah. everything right. I achieved, I accomplished. And inside, I don't want to say I felt worse than, you know, when I was younger, but I felt quite empty. It was almost like a, the great disappointment. I did everything I was supposed to do, and I don't feel any better about myself. I don't have more confidence. I don't have more um, self-belief, more self-esteem. Like if anything, I just thought, oh, you just keep going. Like clearly this means just keep pushing for more until you get that feeling. And then I realized ah, that this is the trick of life. That's an outside in approach. Mm-hmm. So we're really doing what, you know, society says we should do. And we don't have the um, the accompanying feeling because it's not the right order. So I started to slowly flip that script and I was like, wait, if I work on the inside stuff, like how I treat myself, the self-acceptance, the self-love, the self-compassion, like all of the self stuff, then very naturally, like you said, and really beautifully, I am just going to be me feeling so good that the accomplishment comes. It doesn't have to be, again, one or the other. So either I'm accomplishing and feeling bad about myself or I'm not going to do anything, but I'm feeling pretty good Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I'm, you know, zen or calm or grounded or whatever. So then I realized, like, I was was really trying to, like, prove my worth. And I started to flip it and I actually just felt my worth. And then naturally, you know, I'm always, I'm just the type of person that is always going to have goals and things that I want to do, but that's life to me. That's exciting. Oh, you're one of the most, you're one of the the right reason. Now I'm really checking my intentions. Am I doing it to show people like, look at me, please love me. Or am I loving myself that I just have to like share this stuff? Like I want to glow. And if I'm not glowing, then that's like back to, you know, the inside work. Yeah, totally no, I th- I think Lindsay, I see so much, so much, um, uh, kind of like natural, joyful ambition in you, and so much boldness, and I and I think I think there that you know when when you are, uh, I mean, this is just naturally what we want to do is to continue to express, continue to to, um, to develop ourselves. Um, so you made the decision at some point, um, you mentioned growing strong girls a minute ago. Um, you made the decision to actually put yourself into the role of writer and author. And um, actually, I want to talk to you about your experience of becoming an, a writer and how that changed your self-concept. Con- but before we get into that, can you just quickly recap for our listeners um, the three books that you have published um, through Wonderwell? And before that, it was Life Tree Media. But the three books that you have published, Growing Strong Girls, Rooted, Resilient, and Ready, and Made for More. Just a quick recap on each to show kind of like what they covered and um, how they fit together. Sure. So a few years into Bold New Girls, like I was pretty darn proud of myself that I had left the job, the J-O-B and the insecurity, and I had started my own company and things were going pretty well. So I felt like I was probably on solid ground. You know, I was making, making money and I had clients and I had connections and things felt pretty good, but I always get to that place of like, okay, getting a little too comfortable. Like what's next? I don't want to, I don't want to say bored. I'm never really bored, but it's sort of like, I just have this feeling inside of me. Like I could definitely do more. I could definitely urge to create. Yeah. Yeah. And level up or whatever you want to call it. Like (laughs) I could do more. Like something was like, yeah, too easy or whatever. So then I I did start thinking about, okay, so I I love what I do. I love my work, but obviously I can only have so many clients at, at one time. And so I think that just became really natural. Like, okay, well, I, a lot of stuff I'm doing is working. A lot of my techniques and strategies are definitely not weird, but 
creative. Like I think that a lot of them are just like what I just kind of come up with in the moment and really in collaboration with the girls. Like I cannot take full credit. Like they bring me a problem or they say something and that, you know, I piggyback on their ideas or we sort of co-create. And, and th- I think that just really easily became like, oh, what if I had a book that really offered the tools and the strategies for parents and maybe even girls themselves. And Growing Strong Girls, I think, is is quite amazing, I want to say, because it's this beautiful balance of information, but super practical strategies. I have never been so challenged in my thinking to come up with like, well, what exactly would this look like? Like if a, <laughs> parent was with her little girl having this conversation or working through the struggle, what would you tell her? Like I had to really push for like that. Okay. It's Monday morning. Your daughter doesn't want to go to school. What do you do? So Growing Strong Girls is for parents primarily, and it's focused on the age range of sort of like eight to 12. Eight to 13, sort of the preteens. And it was just for parents, but I have to say many, many girls tell me that they read it <laughs> or they read it together with mom or dad or or their teacher. Like it's really taken off in schools. And I think, again, it's just really practical, but the foundation piece is so important. And that is about connection. It's about the relationship. It's about um, the ability to have good conversations, to be present, to share ideas, to be able to like have really open conversation without judgment and criticism, to work together, to work through things. Like it's really, I think, just beautiful in that sense. So it's this great balance of information and super practical ideas and um, kind of fun and creative um, projects to work on. And then it, it really became, um, well, what's next for me? And I decided that it was time to, <laughs> I want to say, do the scary thing, which is like really address teenage girls. They can be a little bit, they're amazing and intimidating. And I just, I didn't know if I was ready to deep dive into that, but I think with a bit of confidence for from Growing Strong Girls, I realized I could keep going. And so Rooted, Resilient, and Ready is really for parents of teenage girls, or we could say, you know, 12 to 18, 19 into Mm -hmm. young adulthood. And that was like a very, very like thorough, I think, exploration of many of like the big and sometimes heavier, harder topics, right? So body image and identity and stress and anxiety and other mental health concerns and sex and sexuality and future planning. And we really just put it all in there. And I was able to add more stories and examples. And I feel a lot of research. And I feel like that was like, I am very proud of that one because that was like, um, I don't know, I don't want to say hard, but I felt like I had real courage to like go to like a depth that I hadn't really gone to with these topics and even sharing more of my own Um, my own stories and my own vulnerability. So that one became, uh, yes, uh, let's say a roadmap for parents of, of teenagers. And, um, and then I decided I was ready to do the next, I guess, which is looking at, um, helping or supporting young women. But then we thought, well, at this point, They're parented less because we want them to be more um, independent and come into their own as they start to adult. So this was interesting because I decided, well, I didn't have to write to parents anymore. I could write straight to an audience of young women. Mm -hmm. And that to me was total privilege. It was a little bit less, um, less taxing on my brain because I felt like I didn't have to go parent to daughter or parent to teenage daughter. It was directly to speaking to young women. And I think, again, supernaturally, just so much of my story like came out of me so easily. Like I wrote it, I don't want to tell you this, but very quickly. Like, it <laughs> That's was, good. Well, it was very easy. And I was super inspired because I feel like it was almost like someone saying, um, if you have just like, you know, 10 or 15, like life lessons, like what would you teach these young women? Go. Right. And I right. just like, couldn't stop. I'm like, Oh, okay. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. Do that. Like it just, it just like came out of me. And for this, I, for this, for the young women, you're talking about your third book made for more. Made for more. Sorry. Right. Yeah. And made for more was published, um, pretty recently. It was, was it September or October of, it got released in October Yeah, of 21. 
22. Sorry, like, I was, I was 22. Sorry. Yeah. Do you know, I'm already like hopping ahead. I'm so, when we've done, yeah, let's just, <laughs> the new year. Um, yeah. So Made for More was released in October 22. Just released. Yes. Right. Right. That is, um, that's, that's so interesting, Lindsay, because what you see here is a progression in your books in terms of who, you know, the audience that you're writing for as your sort of, um, I know that the first two books were aimed at the parent is the reader, um, because an eight-year-old is not going to read a theory book about, you know, sort of their own psychological development, um, necessarily. Um, so you're, but you're, you're talking about like the evolution of the, the sort of end user of your book, the person who will benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you're talking about that, I'm sensing and seeing an evolution in yourself as well as an author. Um, talk to me for a minute about like, how was it to go from being like a first time author to a author who has written three books? You've got three books under your belt. I mean, you just described that the third one was easier and some of the credit for that was due to the subject matter. You were kind of closer to it and writing more directly to the reader who would also be the recipient of the material. Um, but I'm, I imagine some of that ease must have come from like, I've been here before. I've done this. Um, I kind of feel more confident in my process. Is that true? Yeah. I'm trying to go back to the beginning, right? Because it's, now it's so long ago. But I had self-published, like you said. So I, I knew I liked to write. I didn't necessarily believe I was good at it, but it's just like anything. The more you do it, the better you become at it, the more confident you become. And so I, I felt like I was probably a decent writer. And this is the story I always tell girls going like, go way back to like grade four. I remember my friends were putting together this yearbook and it was a collection of everyone in the class's biography. And I remember them saying to me like, oh, would you like to write one? So they would just give you a person and their information that you'd have to write, you know, a paragraph or two on the person. And I distinctly said this, I am not a writer. And they didn't know what that meant. They said, well, what do you mean? Like, you just do it. Like, you just practice and then you become a writer. And I, that was such a head scratcher too, because I thought, no, you're born a writer or you're not. I am not. I was not born. Like, I didn't understand. And so thankfully, they encouraged me and they said, oh, just give it a try. So I probably just plagiarized what they had written, just copied, but changed the name of, of the person I got. And... I didn't mind it. And so then I, you know, I tried again and made it a little bit more of my own. And I think that was a really important moment in my, in my childhood, because I realized like with everything, you know, you try it and you get better at it. And then that becomes your skill. It's mm -hmm. not like you're born with it or not. It's not magic. It's not like they were gifted and I wasn't. Um, and so I really tapped into this idea of like, oh, okay, I like this writing thing. So I, I was able, thankfully, to lose that, like, I am not a writer label. And so then, okay, I self-published. And then I remember I received a gift from Vanessa, Vanessa LaPointe. And the gift- Vanessa LaPointe is an, an author of um, uh, uh, several books that our company has published, right? And she- so, uh, And the first one was Discipline here. Without Damage. And that was a really, another important, maybe light bulb moment is that I didn't realize I could actually write a real book. Not that self-publishing isn't real, but to hold a book in my hand written by someone who I shared an office with, like I saw all the time, like she was like, she's like a normal person that mm -hmm. I knew in my circle. And I just, I think something just must have popped in my brain or in my eyes. And I was like, wait a second, if she can do it, what's the difference? Like, I'm not different. I'm just, I'm a different person, but like I can do it too. And that's the day I emailed you. And I had said like, Oh, Hey, like I have this company called bold new girls. I have some ideas. I can kind of write. I probably said, you know, not somewhat, not confidently. And you email back and just said, Hey, let's, let's set up a call. Let's see what you can do. So I just, I had committed to like saying yes to everything. So here I am. And I had come from therapy, um, who, my therapist was saying, let's work on being stronger and braver and bolder. So I didn't really feel like I had a choice. I had to keep <laughs> going here. <laughs> These things are coming together. But at the same time, like you had said, yes. And we got together and you, um, you 
like, thankfully said yes. You know, it was maybe a little bit of a gamble on this wild card. And, you know, we signed the contract and I went ahead with it. But then, like, probably the next day, like, I had several panic attacks. Like, I did not think I could do this. I remember calling my mom probably every day for a while, just Mm -hmm. saying, I think I made a mistake. I signed a contract. I can't get out of it, but I can't do this. Like, who is going to listen to me? Who's going to believe me? What if I don't sell any books? Like, then I'm a complete failure. Who am I? Like, I'm figuring this stuff out. How can I possibly come across as an expert? Like, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't possible for me. Like, I really had so much fear. But I knew, you know, life has taught me, you just keep going. So I just kept going. But the whole time, I really did have have like a sick to my stomach feeling, but it wasn't like, um, it wasn't don't do it. There must've been enough confidence that I kept going, but it was like a lot of self-doubt. Like, are you sure this is what you should be doing right now? And I just had this conflict. So eventually I stopped calling my mom. I was introduced to the wonderful Michelle, my editor, and she really, I don't know what you told her, but she really held my hand every day through the whole process and probably carried me through some of it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I need to like explain that story. I don't feel that way now, but there was such fear and self-doubt and oh no. And the whole time of writing, I was just panicking that I had to go possibly go on television. I think that scared me more than the writing. And oh, it was just so much. But it's I, so I, interesting because I it's a moment. <laughs> like you're afraid of going on television. That that would be a sign of success. And so it yeah. not failure. And so we're we're afraid of success as much as we're afraid of failure because ah, oh, that means I have to live up to it, or that means people are gonna see me and it's amazing. I love hearing you speak so vulnerably about the anxieties that you experienced when you were writing your first book and also the role that your editor played in helping you continue despite those anxieties. I think that this is something that people don't talk about enough when they um when they share their stories of writing their books. You know, we we often hear authors talk about the book itself and the impact and that stuff is all very fun and very positive but to talk about like the deep well of terror <laughs> that you sometimes have to create that book inside of um and the role that a really empathic dedicated coach can play in helping you to manage those demons and keep on going So true. And I think with Michelle, I felt like I could just be straight. There are days when I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Or is that garbage writing? (laughs) Like it was, I think we got to a place of being very open and very transparent. And I think that level of trust really helps. So if you have someone that can be, you know, she was a beautiful blend of gentle and honest. Like I Mm -hmm. never felt like, I think I probably said in the first conversation, like I am so sensitive and I'm so afraid that you are going to judge me. I didn't even send her my sample writing for a long time. I procrastinated. She's like, I got to see it at some point. I'm like, no, because if you judge it, like, what am I going to do? It's game over, but I'm like contractually obliged. Like I've committed to this process. I'm working on being strong. Like it was so much for me. And I remember her saying, well, just, just send a paragraph, like just something, Lindsay. (laughs) You know, Lindsay, you're so not alone with that. Like uh, we, uh, 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 people are different and people have varying levels of um, anxiety about exposing their work to their editor. Um, But I think that, um, most authors feel that and many feel it extremely sharply. You know, many, many authors cling to their material initially and are afraid to submit it for that very reason. And yeah, like you've got to, cause right. You like, they can't help if they, if you, they don't, if they can't get their hands on no no manuscript. (laughs) What, What I really love to say to authors who are like shy about sharing their work with me as a publisher or back when I was editing as an editor, which is that, um, what I like to say to them is that like, listen, I'm, I just think of me as a doctor I've seen it all and I know how to help, you know? So just as like, you wouldn't go into your doctor's office feeling shy about showing them your broken bone, you know? Cause like, oh, it's ugly. It's bent. Like, oh, this looks so bad. You know, it's like, no, you're going to go like, look, look at what is going on with me and please like help make, make it better. So sharing openly with your editor or your writing coach is, is like that. You have to 
it's a it's a bond of trust um and um and i think that that trust strengthens over time when you when you see that they're really they really are on your side yeah and what's interesting now because i have a lot of students that are they're writing essays and and um, reports and doing research and, and they now come to me with a similar problem. Like, Oh no, it's not good enough yet. It's not perfect enough. I haven't edited enough. And I always just say to them, like, I just want to see the mess. Right. I just want to see like the, just show me your garbage writing. That's all I want to see. And then I'm able to explain to them this great process. Like we have to start at zero, show me your zero work and I'll take you to one. And then from one, we go to two and two to three, but I have to see something. And, and some of them don't even get pen to paper because they're so afraid it's not going to come out right. And I'll say the same thing, just like say anything. It doesn't right. matter. Whatever Break comes out, we're gonna get it going to work on it yeah. and we're going to polish it and polish it and polish it and make it like near darn perfect, really good. And that's like, that's how writing happens. I said, please don't be fooled. Like no writer writes perfectly. There is no such thing. You don't see it. And that's, you know, part of our society and social media for sure. We just see the final product. We don't see the cuts. Right. But if you saw, I tell them, if you saw my first manuscript, you would laugh in my face. It's <laughs> awful. I read back some of the stuff to them on purpose, but I said, it's awful on purpose. Like that's what we had to start with. And that was like, you know, whatever the jumbled thoughts that came out of my head. And then we got clarity with each revision and then it came out pretty good. And that's just not the way it comes out. Don't yeah. be fooled. So I'm pretty so how, raw with them, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I love that you're now teaching what you yourself also went through, but how, how long did it actually take you, Lindsay, um, to write um, the first draft for each of those three books? I feel like the first drafts were always about six or seven months. Mm -hmm. Well, again, made for more was a little bit faster, but I did slow myself down. And then there's about six or seven months, the same amount of time, I would say with editing, there's a couple um, passes of editing. There's sort of the, let's just clean it up phase. I don't yeah. know what they're really called. <laughs> and then there's the, okay, let's go through line by line, sort yeah. of a deeper edit. And then there's the editing that people also don't talk about, like the person that edits and does like you know, the spelling and the punctuation and like making sure it's very consistent. And I'd say there's three to four rounds of editing. So that takes yeah. about six or seven months. And, and if needed, you go into the design stage and then you, you go into the, the marketing and the promotion. So it's a process for me. I think everyone can decide on their own timeline, but what was comfortable was about a two year process. From start Yeah. To yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. And I think it's interesting because these days, again, with our sort of like quick fix society, we hear, I, I think people's expectations about how long this should take um, are really out of line with reality. <laughs> you know, sort of sometimes there's a feeling like, I mean, I know that people do self-publish a book that, you know, like, I'm just going to write it in a, a week or two and then just like get it published. You know, it should be up a month from now or, you know, available to, for sale, but those books are not thoughtfully developed. You can't, you can't work with a, <clears throat> you can't work with a piece of writing that is 60 or 70,000 words in length or even 40,000 words in length um, in the space of a weekend or a week or even a month. There's just literally not enough time to give each component thoughtful attention. Um, so I love hearing you talk about like how, how, you know, how your process unfolded and, um, the time you took to, to go through all of those phases. So, um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what your actual writing practice looks like? Do you like to work at a same time every day or, or do you go in binges and spurts or like, how do you, how do you actually sit down and write you personally? That's a good question. My favorite question. Um, so since university, when everyone felt like it was really a good idea to cram for tests, I have always been counterculture, I want to call it. I never, I could never do like the night before, like just, you know, study all night, pull the all nighter and like wreck your next day. Like that made no sense to me. So I am definitely the type of person that's like slow and steady wins the race. Like I have always been this way my entire life. Like I am all about slow and a little bit every single day. You give me a whole year and I'll do the exact same thing every single day. If it means by the end of that year, I'm finished 
and I am relatively balanced. Let's say have some life balance. So the first one, Growing Strong Girls, I think was my chance to like really like explore and experiment with what would work best for me in terms of a practice. And so what I decided in terms of my work schedule and life schedule, um, what I decided to do was take an hour a day. And it doesn't sound like a lot of time, but I figured an hour a day for like, you know, a year or well, two, I guess, essentially, that would get me there. And so I took that out. There's flexibility in that. I mean, some days if I didn't feel like writing, it could have been less. Or some days if I was in flow, it would be a little bit more. So I had a little bit of like flexibility and grace with myself. But I just decided like every single day I do that hour. I'm definitely a morning person. So I do my own thing. Like I try to prioritize like my self-care first. So I'm running and, you know, um, showering and journaling and getting kind of set for the day. And then I'd be ready to go by probably like eight thirty nine, And that's when I feel like my brain is the most on and the most mm -hmm. focused and I'm the least distracted and have like the most energy, I would say. So I'd write for about an hour, but I also realized <laughs> you don't feel like writing every day. This is another thing people don't <laughs> tell you. I'm sometimes I'm just not in the mood or I'm writing and it's bad. I know that it's not good. It's not coming out. It's awkward. It's like forced. So what I would do is I decided that hour would be like whatever it is. Like that's a very like intuitive process that I had to learn to trust because I'm really like disciplined and I'm really results driven. But if in an hour I didn't feel like writing, I wasn't going to push it because it was just a waste of time. So my hour could be thinking they don't tell you how much thinking time you need to write. So thinking, and that might be walking in the park thinking, like sometimes I do my best work when I'm moving my body. Mm -hmm. It could be research. It could be having a conversation with someone. I had to do a lot of reading to know what I was talking about, but also sometimes just to get ideas and inspiration. If you hear like, someone else say something pretty great that then ignites an idea in you like there you go right that's an hour that's you know worth its its time and so I just decided that hour would be whatever I could do and and then when the writing process was done that hour became editing or that hour became improvements or mm -hmm. more research but I just really stuck to that hour a day through the whole thing that became yeah. an hour of you know prepping for for TV and radio and podcasts. Like I just stuck with that hour or the hour might just be, it sounds silly, but dreaming, like imagining like, you know, me with the book in my hand, giving a talk. This is a true story. The whole time I was writing Growing Strong Girls, I was very afraid, obviously very panicked, but I, at some point I must've had a mind shift where I thought, you know, if I'm going to worry so much about it, I might as well put this into like, you know, good, put this to good use, this worry. So I decided to like create sort of this idea of like, well, what about if I played around with wonder? Like, I wonder what it will be like to have growing strong girls and to be standing there. I imagined I was in this red dress with a microphone and I was talking to this room of moms and they were liking it. Like they were like, yes, like good job. Like, like it was really helpful. And I just had the same like idea over and over again, like as I'm jogging, as I'm walking, as I'm like just doing my life, like doing, um, doing the, my daily work with the girls. Like I just kept imagining and the book came out and I started to do TV and radio and like it didn't, nothing really happened as I had imagined it. And about a year after Growing Strong Girls, I get a call from Vancouver Health and Wellness and they were putting on this big conference and they asked me to speak. So sure, I'll go speak. And, you know, I got ready and I, you know, had the microphone and everything. Like I was on my stage, right? I was in my element giving this talk about growing strong girls and, you know, some tips for parents. And they took pictures, thank goodness. And they took a video and they sent it to me. And I kid you not, I was standing on stage with, you know, the fancy microphone in my ear, the headset, and I had the microphone and, or sorry, I had the headset. And then I was speaking with the book to a room of mostly moms in a red dress. And I didn't realize, like it clicked and I was like, oh my goodness. goodness, I visualized this thing and like, they loved it. It was probably one of my favorite speaking events. Cause I felt, I felt so on, but I didn't realize it was part of the visualization and, and part of my process, I guess. But 
there you go. So it was definitely (laughs) the moment where I was like, I did it. That hour a day of imagining, dreaming, writing, thinking, editing, whatever, it it came together. Like it worked, it paid. And I think that was like a true moment of, of success for me, how I would define success of that book. That is such an amazing story, Lindsay, because it's sort of like you hear about, yeah, kind of like visualization and sort of like mocking up your ideal outcome and sending it out to the universe. And what I love is that then you just like release that, which is also supposed to be like a really critical part of the manifestation process, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you just, just forget about it and then move on. And then you got that beautiful demonstration, which was like, you know, the picture and video of yourself actually living that moment. Right. So, um, wow, so that is so, <laughs> that is, you always think like, why don't I do more of that? Like what, you know, it worked and that probably took a lot of thinking time, but it right. definitely channeled my worry. So I was happy about the strategy, but like, why, yeah. like, I feel like we get afraid almost of that, the power, like it's yeah. so powerful to like call your shot. Like I called yeah. it and then it happened. And I think part of me is like, did that really happen? Like, did I do that? And then a part of me is like, why don't I do more of that? Like, look how powerful I proved to be. I mean, Lindsay, you clearly did every part of that from imagining it to actually putting in the hours (laughs) to actually showing up and saying yes, and then acknowledging it and like depositing that as a win. So yes, you really did all of that. (laughs) But I know what you mean. It's like, well, why don't we set our sights a little higher and like, you know, but I think that we do. I mean, that's what you're doing. Right. And, um, and that's what made for more is actually all about, right. Is, is like, um, well, talk to me a little bit about this. I love the framework that you have in made for more your new book, um, which is, um, which, which is about uh, less of this and more of that, right? So t- t- talk to me a little bit about, about that concept where you have more connection and less anxiety or the, you have several kind of like um, uh, pairs of concepts that you roll out in that book. Yeah. So this was a really interesting one. So I decided that I obviously wanted to help young women. And what I noticed is that I mean, like all of us, they're very distracted. They're very like stressed and anxious and overwhelmed. And, and I feel like there's so much focus on the external, like whether it's appearance or accomplishments or achievements. And in the book, I unpack this idea of like supergirl syndrome. Like they all seem to, you know, want to be so much and do it all and please everyone and be perfect. And like, whoa, like these stakes are high. Like they've definitely intensified from the time I was in my, in my twenties. And I thought, you know, like, that's a lot, but I feel like something's missing. Like, I feel like that inside journey is, is not really getting its attention, right? Like these girls might be great again on paper, but do they feel great? Mm -hmm. Do they feel amazing and confident and powerful? And I just didn't think so. So when I was thinking about, well, how do I help them? Like, I think the one, the one thing that I could help was to turn them inside. So like starting from that inside job of like more confidence, more bravery, more connection, more mindfulness, more power. Like if they had more of that, if that became their focus, then again, the accomplishments, the achievements, I think that comes naturally. But what what we do is remove the pressure. It's not about proving their worth. It's about feeling it and being it and just being human beings, not human doings, right? As the saying goes. And so I remember thinking like, okay, I can say more happiness, but to create the space for happiness, there has to be sort of like an equal, like, opportunity to let go of the stuff that's in the way, the distractions, right? Right. Because we didn't want the book to become yet another sort of thing to beat yourself up about, right? Right. Like Like you're not happy enough. Come on. Here's what to do. So it's like, yes, we can say like, be more happy, but the counter of that or the opposite is, well, what's stopping you from being happy, right? Like it's there, you know what it is. You probably want it as most humans do. So what's getting in the way? Is it that, you know, you're sad, you're telling yourself, you know, the same sad narrative over and over again. Is it that you're too stressed to be happy? Maybe you haven't even thought about what happiness means to you. Like there has to be some thought work really around like, okay, if I'm going to create this happiness, 
what is it that I have to let go of? Maybe it's the job you don't like, like I didn't like, or the people that are no longer supporting you or best fits for you. Like you have to make the space, but I don't believe there's space for both. Yeah. We cannot have the unhappiness and the happiness coexist. It doesn't work that way. So it's really that positive shift, like whatever you want more of. Like I unpack the seven ideas, but it can be whatever. Like it's very, I wanted this book to really be about her journey, their journey, I should say. And whatever it is, their more is. But to create yeah. that more, can we be as intentional about the letting go? And I think that's another thing we don't talk enough about in our society is the grieving. I have to let go of these people. And that's hard. When I quit my job, like that was one of the hardest things because I was disappointing a lot of people. Mm. They were mad at me. And that's something I have always been so uncomfortable with. So I would rather stay at a job and make sure everyone's happy than to disappoint someone. Or people. I had to disappoint clients. So we don't talk enough about that letting go. I had yeah. to let go of the job and the familiarity and the, the people I enjoyed working with and the clients and, you know, all of the expectations that were put on me or the responsibilities that I had. And a lot of my ego, I think, was wrapped up in that. Like, I'm the only one who can do this job. But it was the letting go. And I think that's that was a process that caused a lot of tears. That was really, yeah. really hard. But after the tears, like you work through the discomfort, you do get to something better, right? And so sometimes what we're letting go of, yeah, so we were letting go of others' expectations, which is about stepping out of being a people pleaser and more authentically totally. pursuing what matters to you. Um, but, and, and, um, and the the other thing that um, that we are confronted with uh, that we need to sort of let, let go of, I suppose, in pursuit of our dreams is... Um, letting go of letting go of the fear of standing on the stage of writing the book letting go of you know the the um attachment to the discomfort you know letting go of letting the discomfort stop you right so that that that's all kind of part and parcel of moving forward with you know in this case we're talking about both the content of your book and also the experience that you had in writing these books um so it's thinking about your, um, your experience, your story that you just shared about standing on stage in your red dress and, um, talking about your book, um, that leads me to wonder about what it has been like for you in the sharing part. I mean, one of the things that we talk about a lot on this podcast is it's not just about doing your work. It's about going public with it, right? Sharing it with the world. So you've written these books, they are out there in the world. People are buying them and reading them. Um, you're getting reviews on Amazon. You're getting people coming up to you and talking about it. You're 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 putting yourself, you know, in that one hour a day through the processes of promoting the books and 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 sharing them. Let's go into let's let's hear from you about like what what has that been the sharing part? What has that been like? Yeah, that was pretty scary too. I forgot that. I have to go back. So now I'm the type of person I really don't care. I care okay, a little. So that right there is so interesting because you've, you've grown and changed so much. I just know, in that, so so, so in the beginning, you were scared to share. And now on book three, that is not an intimidating experience for you anymore. I know that you had, you had like a TV appearance that we just shared with our sales reps recently, and you were so awesome and eloquent, but how did, how did that, how did that evolution take place? Tell me about okay, that. That's interesting. So awesome and eloquent. I will take, thank you, but equally afraid. And I just don't want yeah. people to think like, it doesn't seem to get easier. Not for me. It doesn't seem to become like more natural. Like I feel like a little more confident, but still afraid. Like I feel like people need to know it's both. Now I feel like I do a pretty good job. I'm fairly confident that I'm going to say something. I know, like, I don't think I'll freeze, knock on wood, but it's still, it's still scary. So I think if I go back to Growing Strong Girls, I was afraid of the writing and I was afraid of the, going on TV and doing the interviews. And I was definitely afraid of judgment. So what are people going to think? Like, I kept thinking, but I'm not a parent. Like, it was such a negative script. Mm. Like, I am not a parent. I am not a parent. I am not a parent. I told myself that so much. I almost talked myself out of writing it. Because who am I? But I was able to shift and be like, well, I'm not a parent, but I'm a parent. Like I'm a pseudo parent. I'm with these girls sometimes more than their own parents. 
Mm -hmm. I'm doing everything a parent does. Like I'm showing up, I'm listening, I'm loving these girls. Like, how is that any different? I'm just not a biological parent, Mm -hmm. but like, I am like, I had to really work hard on that negative. Yeah. A a role model in those girls' lives. And you're, you know, helping them sometimes in ways that their own parents don't have the skills to do. Right. So I was like, I count too. Like, it's just different. So I think I had to really work with my own, um, negative self-belief and some of those negative scripts that I was not good enough. I was not worthy. So I I got to a place of like, okay, like, I think it's okay. Like I can be an expert without being a parent. And, and I don't know at all, I would say, but I I know something like I'm, you know, I'm, it's not that I know nothing, but I remember when the book came out, I needed strategies. Like I like process and I like plans and I like strategies because I feel like if I've, prepared or planned for things, they're going to hurt a little less. So I remember asking if somebody could filter um, the comments on Amazon. So, oh my God, Paris, Paris, yeah, and, Paris I were working together work together. and I yeah. said, please, can you filter the comments, the messages, the reviews, anything, just give me the good ones. Cause I thought at least Like I would get used to like, you know, getting the positive feedback. And then I thought I'd build up my confidence. And then I would say, okay, Paris, like, give me the bad ones. Like I'm ready now. Right. And like, I think our worst fear as a author, especially a new one is that someone's going to say like, that sucks. What were you thinking? So I was like, okay, like that's the worst kind of comment I could get. So he definitely filtered them. I don't know that I got too many negative ones, or at least to this day, I've I haven't really heard of any negative ones, but I also had another strategy. I kid you not. I had a jar, a glass jar, and anytime a positive comment was messaged to me or I got an email or just like an in-person comment, I would write the compliment on a piece of paper and fold it up and I would put it in the jar and I called it my compliment jar. So I thought if I ever got a bad one, it's okay. I know the brain likes the negative more than the, the positive, but I'd go to my jar and I'd build myself back up by reading all these comments. But again, I didn't really need it because I mean, it's a really, it's a sweet book. I don't think anyone's going to be too harsh with me. Um, but I just had to have some strategies to like, remember, like, you know, I'm doing it to help people. I'm not like in court. They're not trying to get me. It's not like interrogation. I didn't, you know, the police aren't trying to get me of a crime or whatever. Like I just, I had to really like figure out some ways that would really safeguard me and help me. And I slowly started to get more comfortable with like any comments. I mean, some of them were probably neutral or Mm -hmm. I did read a comment on Audible. I think Growing Strong Girls was on Audible and I recorded it because I thought that was pretty cool to be the voice of my own book. And someone said, I over articulated all the words and that was very annoying. So well, I should because have, you're Canadian. That's <laughs> maybe. And I should have hired a voice coach. And I oh remember saying to my partner, like, this is terrible. And he's like, Do you think that person has done a book and recorded their own book? Like, who are they to say? Then he's like, Well, why are you reading those comments? Why, like, why would you even read them? That's destroying your soul. And so that was the last time I looked at comments on Audible at this point. I don't care. So I think over time with these strategies, I got a little bit more comfortable. And there came a point, I don't know what, maybe it was with Rooted, Resilient and Ready. I just stopped caring. Like, I honestly, I care about what you think, Maggie, and I care about what my friends and family think and my clients, but I don't care what the stranger in, you know, Northern California. California has to say about the book that they apparently hate. Like, I really don't care. I don't have time to care because I have all these good things going on and I have this purpose and passion. So of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but what purpose does that serve me to read it and to ruminate on it, to think, oh, I should clearly stop writing like that. It just doesn't serve my purpose. Right. Um, to look, to look for your own, like to look to it as a measure of your worth or, or as permission to continue or an yeah. order to stop like that. I don't so want to be that I, fragile I, anymore. I was like, what no. I hear you saying is that even though you have jitters around going on TV or whatever, you also have a storehouse of like, you're, uh, you're aware intellectually that you have developed some competence in those media appearances. So you go like, okay. And, and then also just disengaging from like, um, investing so much of uh, your, your own, investing your own sense of self-worth in the experience that has given you a, a buffer and enabled you to push through the jitters and go out there and promote the work. 
Totally. I mean, people will always give unsolicited advice. So I've got enough of it over the years to remember, like, if I don't ask for it, I really don't value it. If I'm not saying like, hey, I'm going to give this presentation. Could you please tell me? I've asked you for feedback too. Like, can you give me some positives and, and then some, you know, constructive criticism? Mm-hmm. That's, that's different. But if someone just comes up to me and says, oh, hey, just so you know, next time you shouldn't do this or do more of that or whatever, like, I really, I don't. I just don't take it anymore, but I have learned a trick Um, after every media performance or book or presentation or whatever it is, even this podcast, like I will take time to evaluate myself because I think at this point I do know myself pretty well. We do all have blind spots. I understand, but I can evaluate. I can say like what I did well, there's my acceptance. And I can say, here's some things I'd like to do better next time. There's my change and my growth. And then I feel pretty good about it. And then it doesn't really matter what someone says because I've already done the job. Like I can't really be blindsided by the negativity anymore. Um, And so I just, I sort of learned that trick along the way too. Like I should evaluate myself. It should come from the inside. And if I ever don't know, I'll ask someone, but I'm going to ask someone who's yes, objective, but also like someone who I trust. I'm not going to ask a stranger. Yeah. I love that. That's so empowering. Yeah, it really, <laughs> really self-empowering. Um, Lindsay, this has just been such an amazing conversation and you're clearly not stopping. You're not done. You no. are, you know, going to keep on going. And I know that, um, there is, um, you know, that there are the seeds being planted for book number four. Are you ready to talk about that yet? I think I can talk about it if it's okay with you. Yeah, it is okay with me. (laughs) It's so interesting because I was like, my, my brain is pretty set. I'm like a train. Like I'm like next, 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 next. So growing strong girls. Yes. Um, for girls and then rooted, resilient and ready for teens and made for more for young adults. And I was like, I guess I'll do the next one, like for women. But I'm like, I don't feel like I'm ready for that one. Cause that's sort of like, now it's my demographic. So then I thought, you know, it makes more sense to actually circle back to the beginning. And here's my thought process. Like, I love writing Growing Strong Girls, but obviously I was new. That was brand new writing. But what I didn't have the chance to do is like actually go like pre eight years old. And now with all this experience and all this wisdom, I think I could do a pretty good job of like getting parents really ready. So, you know, by eight, a lot has already been established. Yeah. And it's not to say we can't start any age and stage. Like that's not, I think we can always support and help girls and definitely like um, boost and and build up confidence and self-esteem and bravery and all that good stuff. But I just can't help but think like if we started even sooner, knowing now, like we know so much more could we even start younger at helping girls like check in with themselves, have their little voices, be strong and confident, you know, care less about what people think and getting that stamp of approval. Like if we did some of the foundational work, what would that eight-year-old girl of growing strong girls look like? Right. And I can't help but think that like, I feel at this point, it's a responsibility. (laughs) Like I'm like, I'm the person, I have the magic beans. Let's go back to the beginning and let me just really like set them up for that success or more success or however we want to say it. And um, I think that that's, that makes sense to go back to the beginning and do like the prequel, I guess we could call it of growing strong girls. I love that so much. Well, I can't wait to get started with you on that book. And in the meantime, Made for More is um, out there and available for sale in bookstores everywhere. Um, And where else can people go on the internet or social media to connect with you, follow you, find out more about your work? So the best place is my website, lindsayseeley.com. And also they can follow me on Instagram at Bold New Girls. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with me today, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. And I love your vulnerability and openness. I think that um, it's just tremendously helpful for people to hear the truth of what it's really like and how you've overcome, you know, that resistance and those inner barriers. Thank you. Just to recap, it's hard, but incredibly gratifying. It's both. (laughs) Amazing. Thank you so much. 
I really hope this conversation has inspired you to give so much of your gift to the world that it expands you into your greatest possible version of yourself. Remember, it's not selfish just because we also benefit from it. And here's where I get to make a selfish request. New podcasts need all the help they can get. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Selfish Gift Podcast and send me a DM. I'd love to hear how you're sharing your gift with the world.